All right, I think we're going to get underway here. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, coming. Welcome to On the Issues at Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Boucher. Our guest today is Kevin Merida, gentleman to my left. Kevin is an associate editor with the Washington Post. He has written features for the Post Style section. He has been a columnist for the Post Sunday Magazine, but he's here today to uh, talk about the book that he co-authored in the last year. It is called Supreme Discomfort, The Divided Soul of Clarence Thomas. So let's give a Warren Marquette, welcome to Kevin Merrick. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Uh, Kevin just got here a few minutes ago, and we were talking about the, the timing of this visit, which really couldn't be any better for us. Uh, as a lot of you know, uh, Justice Thomas has just released a, a memoir uh, called My Grandfather's Son, and he has been everywhere. He's been yeah. on uh, 60 Minutes, he's been on Nightline, he's been on the Rush Limbaugh show, we've seen a lot of him, yes. and he's been a fairly private guy up until this point. So I want to ask you, uh, is the guy that we've been seeing the last few days the, the man that you found in the exhaustive research that you did for yeah. this book? Well, uh, first of all, I wanted to say thanks for, for being here. I spent my early career here at the Milwaukee Journal and uh, so I still have a lot of fond memories uh, about Milwaukee and actually, amazingly, actually was an adjunct uh, the journalism professor. I must have been the youngest at the school at the time teaching in a journalism course. So it's nice to be back to Milwaukee. Thanks for arranging this, Mike. Absolutely. Um, I was really fascinated watching the CBS uh, 60 Minutes interview in both the Nightline, because these are long magazine uh, shows. And Thomas, to my knowledge, has never been on a show like that. Um, you know, certainly not during the court. It was really an extraordinary just seeing him sit and talk and to participate in something like that. He has um, a very complicated and, and relationship with, with the media. Um, you know, he doesn't like the media very much, and during the course of our reporting for the book, one of the early times when I thought we had a chance to get his cooperation, uh, and it was at a judicial conference in St. Louis, and I really had come to the impression that maybe he will cooperate, and I remember we were just kind of talking informally throughout, and, and at almost every turn he would turn the conversation back to the media and say, you know, you guys have a, a lot of scoundrels in your business. Why do you have so many scoundrels? Uh, and with all due respect to the lawyers and future lawyers, I thought, well, Justice Thomas is a lot of, a lot of scoundrels in your business, buddy. Uh, I didn't quite say that, um, but I was thinking that. I was thinking that. Um, but he, he really feels uh, hurt by the media and, and wounded. But one of the things that we, we found um, in the course of doing the interview, because a lot of what you see, I know we all have contradictions in our life. I mean, with the media, I mean, Thomas also has uh, relationships with the media. I mean, he goes to baseball games with George Will, uh, the conservative comp. He's known to, to read stories and commentaries because we've interviewed people um, for which this has happened, where he'll call up columnists and uh, and say, I read your, your column and, and offer some feedback. Um, and Very so, close to Rush Limbaugh. Yeah, Rush Limbaugh officiated at his wedding. Um, and so he has these other relationships. Uh, Juan Williams, who would, could arguably be called uh, the, the person who put Justice Thomas on the map because he wrote, uh, when he was a backwards, he was a Washington Post uh, editorial writer, he wrote the first op-ed column when Thomas was a young conservative and put him on the map. Um, he went to Juan Williams' 50th birthday party. He's very close to Juan and mentions him. So, you know, it's, it's not the media per se. It's obviously some selective media. Uh, the interviews were with 60 Minutes and, and um, Nightline were, were also interesting, I think, as we talked a little earlier, because they didn't really contain any competing points of view. Uh, they were just, you're just listening to him talk about his life. Um, and I, I think that the way Thomas sees himself, I think he, he believes that he's been unfairly maligned in, the, in a sense and not allowed to have his point of view kind of stand for the public that, that 
at every turn, you know, he's kind of ducking incoming, you know, media rights. Um, and I think you get a very strong sense of that when you read his memoir. Do you think, Kevin, uh, based on what you found in, in your research, that in some cases he has been unfairly maligned? I think you drew an interesting parallel in the book with Justice Thurgood Marshall. Hmm. Uh, and you talk about the way some people describe Justice Marshall when he was on That's the right. bench, and they use those same terms to describe Justice Thomas. Is yeah. there some truth in what he says, that maybe he yeah. has been unfairly maligned? Yeah, well, I would call that our uh, counterintuitive chapter. You know, I would direct people to chapter 14, because uh, I think in most venues, people would find not a uh, scintilla of uh, uh, likeness between Justice Thomas and Marshall. Uh, in fact, in their jurisprudence and in their approach to the, the Constitution, and there would not be similarities. And yet, as black men, I think that you found a, a lot in terms of the critics. They were both uh, treated much the same way by the critics. I mean, Justice Marshall was always said to be the one to follow Brennan. You know, they were the two liberal stalwarts in the court, but it was never Brennan who was following Marshall. It was always Marshall who was the lesser light. Um, they said about Thurgood Marshall that he didn't do his work, that the clerks did most of his work. If you read The Brethren by my colleague Bob Woodward, his, his, one of his great, early great books with Scott Armstrong, I mean, you know, Thurgood Marshall's portrayed as somebody who, uh, particularly in the later years, was, was drinking a lot, didn't, wasn't bringing the intellectual heft uh, to the court that others were. Um, you know, they say much the same about Justice Thomas. You know, that he follows Scalia, that uh, he doesn't do much of his own work um, because he's silent on the court. He's not as smart as his, as his colleagues. And, and I think in that way, there are some similarities. There are others, too, because um, Justice Thomas has been very harsh uh, with the, the, the prominent act against the prominent activist of uh, his day, the civil rights establishment, the Jesse Jacksons, the Al Sharptons. Um, but... Thurgood Marshall was also very critical of Malcolm X and, and other of the militants who, at the time, thought that Thurgood Marshall was uh, someone who was maybe a little bit out of step, and yet he was probably responsible, uh, more responsible than any human being uh, ever for the legal dismantling of Jim Crow. And so, you know, they often found themselves at odds. But of course, in the in the main arena where it counts in terms of their 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 uh, judicial philosophy, they were wildly apart, and Thurgood Marshall certainly was disappointed that Clarence Thomas was the one that took his seat. Uh, let's talk for a moment about race in, in Clarence Thomas's life. Uh, I was struck by a, a question that Justice Thomas was asked in a 60 Minutes interview, which I'm sure a lot of you probably saw, and, and he was asked how he viewed himself, and I think the question was, do you view yourself as a black man? And his response was, I'm a man who happens to be black. I'm a human being. Um, and yet, in your research, you found that uh, there were many instances, whether Clarence Thomas was in a largely white environment, uh, or um, whether he was um, uh, in a predominantly black environment, he had racial issues with a number of different people. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think it's, it's one of the, I think, a, a striking kind of contradiction and uh, at least a, a, a parallel, uh, a, a divergence, rather, um, with the way he has presented himself in certain circumstances and, and, and uh, presented himself a different way in other circumstances. I was struck by that, that answer because it... it it illustrated that he was really not comfortable saying that I was that the black part of his identity is really high in his consciousness. I mean, he said that he was a man, he was an American. He said, you know, he was five feet eight and a half, and that you know, who knows what part of these various identities um, are, are most important at any given time. It's clear, though, in his in his book that he's very racially conscious. Um, you know, you can see that in this book and you can see that in his life, that he's somebody who has filtered much of his life through a racial prison. Um, you know, he talks about 
uh, for, for instance, those who accused him of, um, those who went after him during the confirmation process, he's likened them to the Ku Klux Klan. Um, he's likened himself to some of literary figures such as Bigger Thomas uh, and, and Richard Wright's native son and also Tom Robinson who was uh, the, uh, the black man on trial in To Kill a Mockingbird who was uh, wrongly accused of raping a white woman. I mean, he's put himself uh, uh, in those literary figure shoes to explain himself. And, and I think, and they think that's uh, quite unusual. I mean, it, it shows a level of understanding not only the, the history of, of race in this country, but the sense that the things that have happened to him uh, are in part, have in part happened to him because he's a black man. He has, um, at, at least your findings were, that, that he has lingering issues, and, and maybe even the word bitterness might apply here, towards what might be called the black elite. Hmm. Um, why is that? Well, he, uh, he grew up, first of all, in Pinpoint. Pinpoint is not even a town. Pinpoint is a pinpoint. Outside it's in Georgia, Georgia, outside Savannah, Georgia. It's an unincorporated uh, community uh, that was founded by freed slaves. And in the first five, six years of his life, that's where he lived, barefoot. His family had a, uh, a shanty, and there was an outhouse in the back. His house burned down. And it was during that time that his mother moved the boys to uh, he and his brother, to Savannah, and she struggled for a great while, living in a tenement on a, a maid's salary, and he talks about how uh, sometimes he didn't have anything to eat, um, you know, that there was raw sewage backed up, um, and his mother really couldn't provide for her boys. His father had left him the family when he was two years old, and uh, his grandfather then was persuaded to take the boys in and raise them along with the grandmother. And uh, the grandfather was an illiterate man, you know, had a fourth grade education, but was self-taught, uh, could, you know, put an engine together uh, with his hands, but taught himself, taught himself to read with the help of uh, the nuns, uh, and mainly by reading the Bible. His grandfather uh, became a fairly successful businessman, had rental properties in Black Savannah and also a fuel oil business that was the number one fuel oil business in Black Savannah. And so uh, he looked at his upbringing and what he saw, his grandfather helped put him through Catholic schools. The Catholic schools were segregated during that time and so he went to Black Catholic schools. That was a step up from the public schools during uh, the Jim Crow period. And he looked at others who were across the track, so to speak, and who might have been uh, the sons and daughters of teachers and, and others who would have been uh, of professional class, that, that they looked down on him, that he was teased because of his dark skin, called America's blackest child in, in school. And uh, he remembers these things. He holds on to them, um, you know, 40 years later. Um, and so he says that, and we mentioned in the book, that a lot of people talk about the, the kind of racism and that, that existed. He says that a lot of what uh, people don't talk about is the discrimination that's intraracially. Uh, and uh, that, that's fascinating. Not everybody sees these things the way he sees them. I mean... Uh, there are many people who grew up and said, ah, you know, everybody teased people on the playgrounds. They played the dozens. Uh, you know, uh, light-skinned people were teased too. But Thomas has held on to that, and he's held on to it not just from his upbringing, but all the way through the confirmation period um, when he's uh, continued to kind of keep a list in his head, we were told, of people who were for and against him. And he says that many of the people who were against him, at least from the black side, were the same elite, light-skinned blacks who were uh, uh, back at Yale Law School and were the sons and daughters of the privileged class. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk for a moment about how he is viewed in the, the African-American community. Um, he's a lightning rod uh, for 
for many people, I think it would be safe to say, in yes. the African American community. Uh, is it merely because of his stance on affirmative action? Is there more to it? What, what did you find? Well, I think it's, a, it's, it's very complicated. I think that, I think Justice Thomas sees it as simply he does not adhere to a kind of black orthodoxy, that you have to think a certain way if you're black, you have to be for affirmative action and, and you know, the use of the government to help the poor and, and other positions that he would con consider classically liberal positions. Um, and that if you're not for that, then you're somehow rooted out of the race. I think it's more, more complex than that. I mean, part of it is simply, you know, you, you're coming behind Thurgood Marshall. Uh, and I think there are certain expectations. There are expectations placed on, on many high-achieving African Americans, regardless of their stand. Uh, Oprah Winfrey faces it. Will Smith faces it. Bob Johnson, who's the uh, founder of black entertainment television, often gets that and, and once told me, I mean, that, that they won't, no one will let him just be a billionaire, you know, like, like, like uh, um, Bill Gates, that there's a social responsibility that comes with being him, that people want him, he gets more credit when he gives his money away rather than making it. And so I think that that is, is a product of the history of this country. I think when there are more African-American justices, um, the same thing happened in the early years with Jewish justices after Louis Brandeis was the first, um, and many people at the time, um, were, that first selection was debated. I mean, they thought Louis Brandeis was not Jewish enough, um, some people thought. Um, and now when you, you, know, you talk to Justices Scalia and Ginsburg, no one really thinks of them as Jewish justices because there have been a number of Jewish justices. Um, I think that, that he's laboring under expectations, so that's one. I think the other thing that, that's at work is that he's the product of Republican administrations. He was sponsored and um, you know, groomed and you know, spotted early, um, starting in the Reagan administration when he was uh, assistant uh, uh, secretary of education for civil rights, then at the EEOC uh, Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, the longest serving chairman in the history of the agency. Um, that long executive branch tenure um, involved some clashes from time to time with civil rights figures uh, over various policies. And Thomas often found himself in the uncomfortable position of not always agreeing with some of the rightward moves of the Reagan administration, trying to battle inside, and, and from the other perspective, catching it from outside, who from civil rights groups had thought that here's this guy you know, inside the Reagan administration either not doing enough to stop uh, the worst um, pullbacks of civil rights or agreeing with it. And so I think some of that estrangement began then, and I think it accelerated during the confirmation hearings when you saw a really fierce battle. I'd like you uh, to comment on his views on affirmative action, and, and for that matter, forced integration. Um, I would characterize them as saying that he believes that the achievements of, for example, African Americans are cheapened by affirmative action, that there is a shadow of doubt hanging right. over all African Americans because of affirmative action. Would that be accurate? Yes, I think that is, that is exactly his point of view. In fact, he uh, reveals in his memoir that he has uh, had a 15 cent sticker attached to his Yale Law degree and it's down in the basement. That it, that it's, you know, it signals that his Yale Law degree, um, which it should be pointed out, he had to actually graduate and get out of it, so it is his degree. Uh, is, was only worth 15 cents. That somehow it's been undervalued because he was in uh, a class of 10 blacks. Yale had an affirmative action program. It was the most prestigious uh, and smallest, small prestigious law school in the country. And um, he felt that people were always kind of looking at him, wondering whether he belonged. And there was evidence of that. Uh, many of his colleagues, it should be noted, went on and, and did pretty well from that class, including Lonnie Guineer, there were a, a number of others. Uh, and he did pretty well himself. Um, but I think that he feels that. Others don't feel that. I mean, um, and, and so a, a number of people, you know, I know with Colin Powell is, a, is another example of someone who um, says that, you know, yeah, I did 
I was a product of affirmative action and uh, in, the, in the military. Uh, I benefited, but what I did with the opportunity really is, is what matters most and that, that other, what others think of what I've become is really their problem. You know, that's something that they have to wrestle with. Um, and I think it's a fixation almost with him that um, he believes that, you know, if affirmative action did not exist, then you would not have this kind of um, questioning of, of black achievement. Um, I'm reminded of a, a conversation I had with James Horton, who's an historian, uh, eminent historian, George Washington University. During the course, we, we had a fellowship kind of together at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington. And we were having lunch, and, and uh, you know, I was talking about the book I was working on. He said, he said that Thomas had reminded him, you know, that um, he said, can you imagine Babe Ruth uh, you know, you think Babe Ruth, when he was hitting all those home runs, was really, you know, kind of thinking, you know, I wonder if I'm as great a slugger as people say because I didn't have to face Satchel Page every day. Um, and, and I think that's a peculiar fixation by, by certain African Americans who, who have felt that, but I don't think it represents most. He, uh, um he tends not to ask many questions yes. when, when uh, cases come before the court. And a lot has been written, said about that. Some people have been critical of that. Um, he says he doesn't really uh, see that there's a great purpose to that. He thinks, frankly, there's a little bit of grandstanding that yes. goes on yes. with that process. Uh, has that hurt him in terms of the way he's perceived by, by the, the legal community, for example? Well, I don't know how broadly with the legal community because I think that there's probably a level of understanding among you know people in this room who study the law and, and know the history of the court and and law professors that that it doesn't mean that you're you're not you're any less bright than your, your colleagues. I think it's hurt him in terms of the image uh, with the public because it feeds into all of the other things we've been talking about. I think it. You know, when people come to the court, it's a really a strange sensation actually coming to the court. You know, um, I, uh, my disclaimer here is that, that I never covered the court. So it's one institution of government. I've covered the White House and Congress, but I've never covered the court. And it's really an interesting institution. When you, and when you come before the court to look and listen to oral arguments for those who haven't been, and you hear and the discussion, and it's such a rapid fire back and forth, and the advocate really can't get a question out before he's getting another question from another justice, and he's got to respond. And, and, and you recognize, of course, in, in, that they're really, the justices are kind of debating each other. They're trying to position themselves, in a sense, through the asking of questions. And a lot of that's what goes on. But if you're a student, you know, it's a group of students that had come to the court, and, they, and they're looking at all of the justice, and they see this one guy who never asked a question. Um, and he kind of sits back, and he looks up, and you don't know if he's asleep. Um, if you're a kid, you know, and, and this has been said, that, you know, it, it looks maybe like it's rude behavior. Sometimes he's whispering constantly with Stephen Breyer, who's to his left, actually. Um, and, you know, it's almost like, you know, He's there, and Stephen buys the the, the uh, consigliere or something, you know. Um, <laughs> and it, it's, you know, you have the whispering, which his grandfather, by the way, would just says plain rude. He would say, "Boy, that's just plain rude behavior. Um, you're not paying attention to what's going on." So you see all of these things happening, and you never see a question. I mean, not not. I mean, like a whole year's worth, a whole term's worth. Um, what Thomas has said, though, about it is that. Um, he said partly that he thinks that, you know, eventually people ask the question he wants to ask um, because there are others who are so engaged in asking questions. Uh, he's also said that, you know, and he's right about this, that before he showed up and never asked questions, there were others like Harry Blackman who um, w was so interested in this whole process that he took actual notes, and those are in his papers at the Library of Congress where you see the scorecards where he had written down Ginsburg asked 20 questions, Scalia asked 15, and he actually kept a, a scorecard. Um, 
because he was another one that didn't ask many questions, but he thought that many of the colleagues asked too many questions. So um, Thomas is right about some of that, that history, but the other thing that he says is interesting, and it gets back to the whole psychology of, of, of Clarence Thomas, is that he, he told a group of school kids in Washington that uh, when he was growing up, you know, he had this Geechee Gullah dialect, which was the dialect of coastal Georgia, where he was from, and uh, he spoke with a very thick accent. He was teased about it. And when he was in the minor seminary uh, studying to become a priest, this high school that trained young boys for the priesthood, um, one of his you know, instructors, or head, I think the headmaster, had told him that you know, if you really want to go farther, you, you know, you're really going to have to, to kind of break through that and, and, and really speak standard English. And it really affected him. He said he was devastated, but he said he developed a habit of listening as a result mm -hmm. because he was so self-conscious about his speech. Um, I think anyone who hears Clarence Thomas today would, would not uh, uh, be able to recognize the story I just told because he sounds like a Shakespearean actor. I mean, mm -hmm. he probably has the, the best diction of anyone on the court, and so it's hard to uh, imagine that that would, have, would even be still in his mind, but again, it just shows you that a story like that is still one that he tells to explain himself, even though it happened many, many years ago and it doesn't comport with what's going on now in his life. We'll open this up for questions in just a moment, but I do want to spend a couple of minutes on the Thomas confirmation hearings. We'll go back to 1991 and the claims by Anita Hill, the former co-worker who says she was sexually harassed by uh, Clarence Thomas. Uh, he has been very forceful in the last several days uh, mm -hmm calling Anita Hill a mediocre employee, uh, that she was not this demure creature that was presented to, to the uh, uh, committee um, and to America. Um, you talk to all kinds of people for this book, his family members, those who knew him in college, those who knew him in his professional life, uh, those who are friends with him, those who have clerked for him, and yet there seem to be no clear answers on that claim of sexual harassment. He absolutely denies it, mm -hmm. uh, calls her, uh, I think, a traitor. Mm -hmm. um, and she is out there over the last couple of days saying, I stand by what I said. It happened. Uh, what did you find in your research on that subject? Is, is there more to this story than what we're hearing? I, I mean, I think that there is more, and maybe more will come out. I mean, some, you know, I'll give a little bit of some of the contextual uh, things that we, we turned up, but um, I would have thought, Mike, that, you know, as someone who was involved in the coverage of that uh, episode, uh, actually was an editor at the time, uh, I would have thought by now that there would have been a something like a smoking gun, something would have come, it would not have been a mystery, you know, like, like, the, like the Kennedy assassination, <laughs> you know, that just kind of stays there. I mean, it really is a he said, she said tell, and I would have thought that there would have been some diary turned up or some witness that would have been able to explain it. I mean, it really boils down to her word against his. And, um, you know, she had, you know, witnesses on her side, and he had some witnesses on, on his side. Um, but nothing has really changed. The, 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 and so I, I think you have to just say that um, we don't know what happened. Uh, we, really, we really have no way of knowing definitively what happened. What we did in our chapter, which is one of the longest in there, is to really kind of deconstruct the episode and go back to the, the key people who were involved in it at the time to kind of get a contemporary take on it and, um, uh, and also add a little bit of context. I mean, one of the things, regardless of whether or not you believe Justice Thomas uh, or, or Nita Hill, uh, there were the comments, the kind of comments that, that she accused him of, which were essentially, you know, lewd, sexual, graphic uh, comments to her as he tried to pursue a relationship she alleged that she did not want to have. Um, many of the, the kind of language used, we found from talking to classmates that go back to Holy Cross and Yale, what are the kind of comments that Thomas you know, whether they were jokes that he said at the time, that he said at other times. Um, 
um, th there was an interest in some of the kind of pornography that, that Anita Hill says that he discussed with her. I think that's been something that, you know, not only me and, and my colleague, but other journalists have documented. So that's just, that's just context. It doesn't mean that, that, that the allegations are, are, are true or necessarily, but it, it is information that I think was not greatly known or widely known at the time. Um, but I think that, you know, you, ha you have to, at the end of the day, y you know, you're kind of seeing now a, almost a relitigation of the, of the hearings. I, I'm struck by, in Justice Thomas's memoir, the degree to which he, he feels pretty, you know, you can tell he still has a great chip on his shoulder for what happened to him and, and, and probably understandably it was a humiliating experience for him. Um, there's a lot of score settling in that, in his memoir in, in which he really takes aim not only at Anita Hill but with the people who, liberal activists and, and the senators that he, he sees as people that were uh, out to get him and, uh, you know, he used this famous phrase, uh, this was a high-tech lynching to describe the uh, Senate committee. Was that a, uh, based on your research, was that a phrase that just came into his mind uh, or was there more to that? I think he has basically said it was not something he really planned to say. Um, what did you find? He, he says that he, um, in his memoir, he says that he was having a conversation with uh, Senator Danforth before he was to testify and uh, one of his original bosses. Yes, Senator, Senator Danforth was really his main sponsor in the Senate and, and had you know hired him as Attorney General right. given his job out of Yale Law School and Senator Danforth of course is known he's Episcopalian priest he was known as somebody who you know they called him Saint Jack he's very had a moderate image and, and someone well respected in the Senate um, but in talking to him, he said that, you know, this is, Jack, this is like a uh, high-tech lynching. You know, he said, this is, this is what it is. It's like a lynching. And, and, and it was Danforth who said, you ought to write that down. You know, that's, you, you, if you feel like you ought to use it. And he said he jotted it down, scrawled it on some paper, and put it with his talking points in, in his pocket. Um, one of the things that we found out during the reporting of the, of the book is that, um, you know, he had thought about the images of lynching a lot. You see it runs throughout his book, his own memoir, where he uses a lot of references to the, the worst of uh, the Jim Crow period and beyond before that, the lynchings and violence done to blacks. Uh, he told that to Arlen Specter uh, some years afterwards for a book that Arlen Specter was doing. We also um, found out that a good friend of his, Cliff Faddis, who was uh, a St. Louis attorney, um, was so incensed by what was happening, this was early on, that he had threatened to have a march down in St. Louis and kind of have a rope hanging like, you know, an effigy, have Clarence Thomas with the noose around him to sh demonstrate this is what they were doing. So this, the image was already planted ahead of time that this was something that was happening to him that was like a lynching. Mm -hmm. We'll take questions. I should say uh, Kevin's actually flying back to Washington later this afternoon and to show you how I guess <laughs> things go in Washington. You're going to what? A, is this a book? So it's a book party for Justice Thomas um, that <laughs> I, I uh, amazingly was invited to and, but, and not by him but by uh, Armstrong Williams who's a, a conservative you know, commentator and is having this big book party in Washington and all of the justices, I think, you know, uh, the vice president and some other entertainers and apparently some of Thomas's own uh, enemies, so to speak, people on the left are supposed to be coming. So it should be quite an interesting thing that uh, will Maybe. be interesting to observe. Maybe we should have you back next week to, yeah. to report on it for us. Uh, let's take some questions from the audience. So we'll start back here. You alluded to this. Um, why do you think Justice Thomas wrote the book? Why? I mean, he says that he wrote it to set the record straight and to have his say over those who, with malicious hearts, I think, uh, who are out to get him. Um, I, I think he has often felt that there has been an awful lot written about him and that he's kind of been constantly, you know, under a looking glass, and that that 
has its own kind of uh, weariness. And, um, you know, one of the things that we just, you know, a little fact that we put in the, the book, after the first seven years and he was on the court, there had been something like 32,000-plus articles written, according to the Nexus search. The closest justice at that time was Rehnquist, who had been on the court for 20-something years, and he only had, like, you know, 19,000 written about him. So the attention on him is great. There have been a number of books written about him. And I think uh, a lot of that all kind of formed, you know, um, in his head that he, he wanted to put something on his own record down. Um, you know, I think I don't want to discount the idea of money. I mean, there, there was a, uh, I mean, he got $1.5 I mean, he's, he's, the financial disclosure uh, report showed that he was the poorest justice. Um, and he was disappointed, too, because he thought leaving Yale, he would land a job at a big law firm, make a lot of money. Instead, he went through government, and I think he's always felt, based right. on your research, that, that, you know, he should have earned more. Never, never made a lot of money, never worked in the private sector. Um, and so he's never been a, a rich man. I mean, so this was a way to, to get, you know, a little a nice piece of change. I'm sure in order to do that, he had to, it's, it's in part because he, the hearings still loom as this kind of seminal event in kind of the contemporary American history. Everybody remembers this as probably the most, it will be probably the most famous judicial hearing ever. Um, uh, and, you know, he was able to capitalize on it. I'm not saying that he did it for that. I think he probably, one of his friends told me he did it. It was, it was a catharsis that, that, he, that once it was over, you could just kind of see him feeling like he was free. Uh, that he had finally said what he wanted to say. Let's, uh, I'm going to go back and forth here. We'll go right over here, start here, and then we'll go back this way. Is it true that he questioned the constitutional basis of most social welfare legislation? Uh, I, I would say, I, I don't know if I would, would say that broadly. Um, you know, he, he is somebody who adheres very strictly, you know, to what he would consider, you know, the original meaning of the, of the framers. And, uh, you know, just to take an example of, of something like, you know, which he's been criticized about, Brown versus Board of Education, um, where he has questioned the, some of the, he thought it was maybe too much social psychology you know, babble that went into coming to that agreement. Not that he questions the idea of removing uh, uh, segregation, but that uh, he's, he's also said, at least in that case, that he has thought that, um, you know, there's nothing uh, that putting black children with white children does not, you know, guarantee a better education, and that uh, that is kind of uh, a myth, and he's continued to hold to that. Um, you know, I, I think that he, you know, like I said, he has a very narrow, I mean, he would like to have more power returned to states, um, you know. What about Bush v. Gore? Does he comment on Bush v. Gore? No. No. No comment on, on, on Bush v. <laughs> No comment on Bush v. Gore. In fact, in his memoir, there's no, um, it stops with Anita Hill, and I think that's by protocol where I think the justices pretty much uh, don't talk about their lives as, as it relates to court uh, at all. Right here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think that that might be a thing that that his memoir would um, certainly a critique that people would have of his memoir that it, it seems a little unjudicial-like 
Um, and it is, I think, a, a unusual in the sense that the kind of books that are normally written, um, you know, Sandra Day O'Connor wrote a memoir. It was about growing up on a ranch, you know, with her brother. And, you know, they're, they're stories about family life. They're, they generally don't get into the political arena. I mean, it's generally something that the justices want to stay away from. Um, and this really, I mean, he takes on senators by name. He says, how, watching Hal Heflin, the late Hal Heflin, uh, question him during the hearings was like watching a slave owner sitting on the porch in the plantation. I mean, these are pretty, you know, he says Joe Biden reminded him of the song Smiling Faces by the Undisputed Truth that he was lying in his face. So these are things that, you know, these are political figures and, you know, justices, every, every year the judge, uh, two justices represent the court and they come up and they have to get their appropriation like every other uh, uh, agency and department. They, they have a budget that they, and they come up, appropriations committee, so they still have interaction with the executive branch. And so I think it's, it's not the kind of thing that generally, you, you know, you, justices want to see happen um, because it, it invokes, again, a political figure. And in many ways, just the way in which the tour, his, his book tour is being uh, a kind of um, handled. There's a consulting firm that's involved in it that's been involved in some very heated political campaigns, Swift Boat Veterans uh, in 2000. They represented Newt Gingrich uh, and, and when, the, when they took over the House. Um, you know, nothing wrong with the think tanks, the Heritage Foundation, the Federal Society, and the um, uh, National Center for Policy Analysis, all con conservative groups with, with certain views of the law. Nothing wrong with them, but the fact that they've kind of come and marshaled that on the website, the Heritage Foundation has a video clip of the book. It, you know, it has the, the feel of kind of a, a judicial nomination campaign as opposed to just a a book being released. So um, I think that's really interesting to note. Other question? Let me, uh, let me go back over here. Yes. Um, I think it's generally thought of as Clarence Thomas is an intellectual language. Is that just a term they throw out? Based on your research, first of all, what is an intellectual language? And is Clarence Thomas an intellectual language? I wouldn't characterize him uh, that way. Um, you know, he has very strong opinions. He writes very strong dissents and concurrences. He, you know, he's somebody who is not, um, doesn't write on very many constitutionally significant cases. You know, with the court being divided the way it is, you know, the winning side really couldn't give him a, a closely divided case because for fear of losing that last vote. And, you know, um, and so I, I think that he's positioned himself in a certain way as kind of a champion of, he wouldn't use the term, but in common terms it would be, you know, political cause, I mean, causes that the right, those on the right uh, are really interested in. He's considered much more of a pure conservative than even Scalia. Um, not willing, I mean, willing to overturn precedent where Scalia is not as much. Uh, as he told us, we had three lunches with him. Uh, he, he prefers to let sleeping dogs lie uh, and, and correct the things that can be corrected in the future. But I think that, um, I think it's probably unfair to call him an intellectual lightweight. I think that's an unfair knock on him. Um, but it is something that I think is a product and part of all these other things. The fact he doesn't talk on the court very much and uh, the fact that he is, uh, that he came to the court the way he did. I mean, in that sense, I think, uh, by being uh, appointed by Elder Bush when he had, uh, I think, a total of 15 months on the appeals court with not much experience, and Bush called him the best qualified um, jurors. I think that that's kind of where that comes from and, it, and it's grown and it's taken hold, but I think that those who look at what he's written wouldn't, wouldn't agree with that. Mm -hmm. Next question. Go back here. Hmm. 
Well, he, he says he doesn't, doesn't specify too much about Bork, but he, he certainly feels that what happened to Bork, you know, was just, a con, you know, continued on him. Um, and he says in his memoir that abortion was the elephant in the room, as he describes it, and that uh, even though in the end they tried to derail his nomination with the allegations that Anita Hill uh, leveled, that really abortion is the really big issue, that, they, that, that the left is so worried and so fearful that Roe v. Wade will be overturned that anybody who they suspect is not on their side is going to get a really harsh, you know, treatment. And so that's what he says. Um, that seems a little of a stretch um, because, you know, the, the way the charges came out, the allegations came out, I mean, Anita Hill was really not a, um, a willing participant in it. I mean, it, it, it took a while. The, the, the allegations, you know, came about early on, people heard about him on the left, and it took a while to, to get Anita Hill to, to agree to make her allegations uh, public, even put them in the process of the Senate, and then the Senate was very reluctant to deal with it, um, very squeamish about dealing with it. And if they had dealt with it early on and investigated him, um, it probably would have never been the the last minute, second set of hearings, you know, big circus that it was. Um, so, um, but to answer your question, I mean, basically, he, yes, he, he, he thinks that abortion is really the dividing line issue between left and right on judicial nominees, and he's pretty much right about it. Mm -hmm. yes. Achieving a high position Well, I think he says, he thinks that what happens to judicial nominees the, the, on, on both sides and uh, that the kind of vigorous um, attacks and, and uh, the research that opposition groups do against them, it deters really the, the brightest legal minds from coming, wanting to go through that process, not to mention you know, the, judge, the judges uh, and, and Thomas is among them always lobbying for more pay uh, because um, as some of you probably know, the students, once you get to, you know, and, and those who have been former Supreme Court law clerks, I know, uh, I understand the dean has been, um, now, I mean, there's a big bidding war, there's bonuses, there's, there's all kind of things from the big law firms, and so it's hard to get people to come into the, the judiciary with, with, with that kind of uh, uh, loot <laughs> awaiting them. Uh, uh, that said, um, uh, he has been very, one of the surprising things I think that, that we found out in, in our book is that regardless, even though he, no one would ever say he's anything but, um, you know, he's, he's firmly in the camp of the right and, and uh, that would be for political purposes, the Republican Party. Uh, but he has been very supportive of Democratic judicial nominees who were stalled and faced this fate. And in fact, uh, we found probably like a half dozen examples where he intervened and tried to help stalled Clinton appointees um, in, by calling senators on the Hill and intervening with, with the Orrin Hatches and Trent Lotts of the world to unblock their nominations because he felt like that should not be done to them over politics, that Clinton, of course, he's going to, you know, nominate the kind of uh, appointees that fits in with his notion of the ju judiciary. And so uh, much to the surprise of many liberal Democrats, including one that we, a federal judge by the name of Victoria Roberts, who had opposed Bork, and essentially her nomination was held up by the Senate for a year because she had been active in opposing Bork. It was kind of a punishment. He helped unlock that and, and got her um, confirmed. Question here. What role do you see Justice Thompson's cabinet playing for the judicial law? That's a great question because it has both 
it's, it's certainly informed it, and it's, it's really been, he's, he's had a very complicated relationship with the Catholic Church. Um, you know, he, he credits the Franciscan nuns who raised him, I mean, essentially, um, you know, were very instrumental in, in nurturing him and pushing him forward. And he, he has relationships with some of the, some, there are a few left who are elderly, and they, he visits them in their nursing homes and, 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 and all of that. And yet at the same time, he went to the minor seminary. Uh, he was the one black student who integrated St. John Vianney in, in Savannah, Georgia. And uh, his experience there was his first encounter with racism. Uh, they would say things like, you know, smile, Clarence, when the lights went out, because it's a dormitory style setting, and the lights would go out and they would say, smile, Clarence, so we can see you. Um, they broke a statue he won from a Latin B, uh, statue of St. Jude. And he, they broke the head off of it and he glued it back and they broke it again you know, when he wasn't there, and he, and he kept gluing it back to, to, to say that, that he would not be broken. He has that statue. This is something he won when he was like 15 years old. He has it uh, at the court, keeps it on his mantle in his chambers, and often brings it down to give people that story. Um, he then dropped out of seminary, and he says because he heard a fellow seminarian after Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, someone had said, you know, I hope the SOB dies. And he says he couldn't reconcile just the, the kind of people who were, he couldn't believe the church was raising in his church these kind of people to be priests. Uh, he, he says in his own memoir that he was upset that the, that the Catholic church was not more adamant against racism. He says that his life might have taken a different turn uh, meaning maybe he would have pursued the priesthood if the, if the church had been, uh, as he put it, as adamant at ending racism as they are at ending abortion. Um, so that's, he was estranged from the Catholic Church for a long time. He joined the church of his wife at the time, which was a very kind of charismatic evangelical church, but he drifted back to the Catholic Church. And in part, he credits uh, Scalia's son with helping him kind of come back to Catholicism, which is where he is now. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Sure. It's usually the, the perception that the court does not have a lot of attention to itself, that they don't have a certain publicity. Do you see any significance that he's doing it at this time in his judicial career? Do you see anything that would connect to the other members of the court and more than the Well, I, I don't know if. Um, I think the timing is, I mean, he's been working on this for a while, and he was late, you know, we were late finishing ours, but he was late finishing his. Um, and, you know, according to friends, he's been wanting to write a book for 10 years. He's been talking about it. Um, and, you know, I think that it, the timing in terms of the release of the book is a publisher decision, and I'm sure that they wanted to release it uh, to coincide with the start of the new term because that's just when the court will be in the news and, and so that's good timing for them. In terms of why he wrote it at this point in his life after being on the court 16 years and he's 59, you know, I think he just was maybe ready to. He may, maybe felt comfortable enough now to be able to, to write it. And, and as I said earlier, there's been a lot of books. Uh, not only ours is, is out, uh, ours being the best one of all the, all the books. Um, uh, <laughs> The, the most complete um, uh, definitive yeah, account. Out right now, isn't there uh, the nine? Isn't that oh yeah, that's on the court, and that's yeah, Jeffrey Jeffrey court. Tubin. That's very good too, mm -hmm. but 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 that's about the broader court. Um, but but just with Thomas, I mean, in the last three or four years, there's been at least three or four books written, biographies, and there've been other, you know, looks at his work as a as a jurist. And I think he, you know, he's told he told someone that, um, you know, why does why is there this fascination with me? You know, uh, and I think he felt like you know he wanted to just put his own take down. Um, maybe maybe he could have done it 20 years from now, which would have been more in keeping with you know William O. Douglas or others who leave the court and or, or are on their way out and they do memoirs. But um, I guess he wanted to to do it while he was uh, still 
uh, vibrant to do it while he was still an active uh, participant in the court. I think we'll, uh, uh, we have like two minutes. If you have a quick question, sure. Uh, thank you. Okay. Well, I think that's a that's a that's one of those questions that he doesn't really answer very much, and, and that's a, that's a somewhat of a dispute. The best that, that we were able to report uh, ourselves was that at the time, um, you know, his grandfather was disappointed at the time at the time of his own death that he was disappointed in his son. I mean, it was not only the uh, estrangement; um, in, in part, it was because he left the church and you know he got divorced. So that was kind of a problem with the church, I mean, in a sense. Um, you know, he, he divorced, and I think that disappointed his grandfather. But I think also the fact that he, you know, first didn't pursue the, the, the priesthood, um, and his grandfather had paid for a lot of his education and said, all I ask of you is not to quit. And he did that. Um, and then when he went to law school, I think his grandfather had hoped that he would come back to Savannah and help other blacks and be a civil rights attorney and use his good education. And I think that was another thing in the back of his mind, but it never happened. So I think that there, instead he goes in with the Reagan administration, his grandfather was not somebody who would have been supportive of the Reagan administration policies. And so um, I think all of those things kind of combined to, to have a disappointment in him. I think we'll uh, hold it right there. I'd like to thank everybody who came here today. We want to mention that tomorrow Archbishop Timothy Dolan will be here spending an hour with us. But uh, let's all give uh, Kevin Merrick a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.